Okay, time for the kids to come on up. Good to see you this morning. We're going to be talking about something very interesting today. Who can tell me what that is? Who can tell me? First hand up. I got to have a more, more exact description of a bug. It's got to be more than just a bug. It's a locust or a grasshopper. Come on up. All right. How many like grasshoppers? Good for you. I can't, oh, black bottle. Yeah, let's turn it around. Okay, she wanted to make sure I saw it was a black bottle. There we go. All right. I don't like grasshoppers because they don't know how to fly right. They just kind of flop around. And, and uh, my wife knows I don't like grasshoppers. So when she finds one, she chases me with a grasshopper. Yeah. And they eat grass. They, they eat anything green. They love green things. They really do. Yeah. And uh, some, you know, some people like holding them. I cannot stand them. I mean, I, I just, I just freak out about grasshoppers. I, I, and you can talk to my wife. Daddy, about I really tickle you like hopping on you. Do you like them hopping on you? Would you like to sleep with a grasshopper? Oh, uh, well, this is where our story, we have uh, a lot to talk about today about grasshoppers. This is called Assumption Chapel. It's in the state of Minnesota. And it's quite a unique chapel uh, because, uh, let's take a look at the front door of it. As we get closer to the front door, what do you see it engraved in the stone? What do you see? The yeah, the locusts there, they're there. And uh, they want to, in fact, some people call this chapel instead of Assumption Chapel, they call it Grasshopper Chapel. Yeah, that's what they call it. And it's famous for that. And why is the place of worship famous for grasshoppers? Who can raise their hand and tell me? Yep. Because it's God's creation. Because what? It's God's creation. Well, it's God's creation. You know what? That's a good answer, isn't it? It's God's creation. Come on up here to the treasure chest. It's God's creation. Ooh, black bottom. And my wife put in the, the candy today, so she made sure there was some extra black bottoms. Is that right, Laura? Yeah. She always does that. She always does that. Okay, well, we're going to find out. Our story about these locusts go all the way back to 1877. That's a long time. That's a long, long time ago, but that's where our story begins. And we're going to find out about these locusts. Yeah, in fact, back in 1877, in the state of Minnesota, in fact, over 80% of the whole state, there were eggs of locusts. They were laid all over the place. There were billions and billions and billions of eggs ready to hatch and ready to eat the farmers wheat and, and, uh, and, and corn and all of their crops there you know back in those days they didn't have what we have today to eliminate insects like that you know they they were at, at their wits end i mean they these were farmers that would, that put every penny of their 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 energy and ownings into their crop and they were so concerned that they were going to lose everything. All their crops were going to be eaten by these locusts, and they were so afraid of that. And uh, science, they actually hired some scientists together to say, what can we do against all these eggs? What are we going to do? And science came up with this idea. They said, take your plow, your horses, or your ox, whatever you have, put a big sheet of, 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 of sheet metal behind it so you can pull the sheet metal and put a, uh, it, it, it was a, a coal tar, 
tar made out of coal, cover that thing up, and then drag it through your fields. And as you drag it through the fields, they will act like a big fly paper, you know, a big sheet of fly paper, and it will just start collecting it. That was the answer that science gave. Yeah? Well, you know, the governor didn't buy into that too well. And his name was John Pillsbury, Governor John Pillsbury. In fact, you may not know him, but I'm glad that Pillsbury was around. I love what he produces because just a few years before this, your mommy and daddy probably know Pillsbury. Yeah, he was the start. He started Pillsbury's Best. Yeah, the flour and the yummy cro croissants and rolls and, and cinnamon rolls. How many are glad that Pillsbury started his business? Yeah, yeah, we're all glad about that. So uh, that's what uh, John Pillsbury, but he was the governor back in, in 1877, and he proclaimed in uh, April 26, as a day of prayer and fasting, that we were going to pray and fast. Who can tell me what fasting means? What does fasting mean? That's a good way to think about fasting, though. I like your definition of fasting better than the Bible. Fasting. Not eating. Don't eat. Spend what, what time you would uh, eating, you should pray. You should pray to God. Instead of eating breakfast, instead of eating lunch or a snack or dinner, get on your hands and knees and pray. Yeah, come on up. You want another one? You got another one. You give it away. Black bottom, Laura. <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay, so. Governor Pillsbury proclaimed April 26th as a day of prayer and fasting, and it actually became a joke to a lot of people. But, the, you know, people from the outside, the people within Minnesota, they took it seriously. The people in Minnesota, this is what they did. In all the schools, they gathered together for prayer. Everybody prayed. All the businesses closed down except for the saloons. The saloon said, we're not closing down. But guess what? Nobody came in the saloons. Everybody was praying. Every, well, almost everybody. See those two boys there? Uh, there there's always a couple, uh, you know, guys that are playing around when it comes to prayer. You know, but they were praying. Everybody was praying. And in fact, it caught the news of the rest of the country and news reporters came and they wanted to interview. Are you praying or you think this is a big joke? In fact, they spoofed on, on John Pillsbury's, Pillsbury's best. They go, this is his best solution. Nothing's going to happen from this. And they were writing about it and advertising about it. It was really a big deal. Well, the next day, you know what happened the next day? It was just not good because it was nice and warm, just the right temperature to make all the eggs hatch. And the larvae came out. Yeah, they came out, and everyone goes, Oh no! Go ahead, hit your head. What are we going to do? They're all, we're going to be smothered by these grasshoppers. They're going to be all over the place eating all our crops. And they did. They hatched, and here they come. All those little tiny guys, when they hatched, they are so hungry! And they were ready to just eat anything that they could get their, their little mouths on. They wanted to eat. All of a sudden, it started getting really, really cold. A special cold rainstorm came down from Canada into Minnesota, and then the temperatures dropped so dramatically. It was it was supernatural, and all of a sudden, 
it started to snow real lightly. And guess who hates snow? Come up here and preach it. Make sure everyone hears you. That's it. Okay, pull on the, the treasure chest. Oh, black bottom. Black bottom, Laura. This is your, your fire. Okay. Yes, the snow. And it wasn't a lot of snow. It just snowed enough so that every out of the billions and billions and billions of grasshoppers, not one was left living. And in fact, they all dropped to the ground. And guess what makes good fertilizer? <laughs> grasshoppers. You bet. Did God do it the right way? God did it the right way. And the next morning, they woke up and they looked at their beautiful crops. And I'm so happy because I love Pillsbury products. Yeah. And, you know, so God answered. Does God answer our prayers? Don't ever forget how important it is to pray to God. How important that is. In fact, the Bible teaches in Hebrews 4.16, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain uh, mercy and find grace in time of need. That's God's counsel. That's what God tells us to do. He says, come boldly before my throne. I want you, you know, when we pray sometimes, you know, when we pray, I want to look at this for a minute. When we pray, sometimes we think, is anybody listening? You know, and my words, do they go above the ceiling? Does anybody hear me outside this room? Do my prayers really go all the way up to God? Yes, yes, they do. When you pray, this is what the Bible teaches. It teaches that your prayers ascend right up to the throne of grace, right there to God. God tells you, your prayers come right up to me. And uh, in fact, the, the parents today, we're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 8. And in Revelation chapter 8, we're reminded that all the prayers are ascending up to God. And when they come up to God, they are so important to God that God stores them, as we learned in, in chapter 5. What adult remembers, what does God store them in from Revelation chapter 5? golden bowls he puts them in golden bowls and those prayers become what before god a sweet aroma a sweet incense comes up before god in other words when you light if someone were to light a stick of incense in this room you would smell it for the rest of the day it would be a reminder that someone started the incense and god is trying to teach us something He's trying to tell us that prayers are a, com are, are a constant memorial, an everlasting memorial before him. So are prayers important? Yeah, so don't forget that. Don't forget how important prayers are. Yeah. Well, uh, before you go to junior church, before you do that, I'm going to sing one more song. It's, a, it's, a, it's an old hymn. Uh, about the beauty of the earth because we're going to be talking the adults are going to be talking about the beauty of the earth and what God's going to do to it yeah uh, so let's stand and let's sing one more hymn okay Oh uh -huh. 
Children, you're excused to junior church. It is again an extreme honor to. Uh, come to God's Word, and we are now uh, looking at Revelation chapter 8, as we look at uh, God's description of what is going to happen. I wanted to sing uh, that song, The Beauty for the Beauty of the Earth, because it is a good reminder of the God of creation. As we look at this chapter, we are going to be shocked. This chapter will reveal that heaven itself is the shock for a short time. Because we're talking about planet Earth that uh, God pronounced as very good when he created it. This is good, God said. This is good. But now we're going to see a reversal of the creation. We're going to be seeing how God will be taking away his creation a little stage at a time. He doesn't collapse the door of creation all at once. He does it slowly. He closes the curtains to his, his creation slowly. And uh, I want you to be reminded of that because it, God is doing it in a slow manner. Because he's hoping that even if there's one individual that will just look up and acknowledge him as the creator God. So uh, planet Earth has uh, really molded and shaped itself into something along with the help of Satan himself to the point where people now worship Mother Earth. Mother Earth is not a, a place of creation. It's, it's our home. It's our start. It's the only place that we will ever have. And those uh, uh, evolutionists and uh, ecologists that uh, tie into evolution, uh, they are preoccupied with Mother Earth. They've taken the creation and made it the creator. They've taken the things that are on planet Earth, uh, the, the, the created things, and, and have reached the point of worshiping the created things. Uh, I've entitled the sermon today, Let the Creator God Correct Your Thinking with His Seventh Seal Judgment. God removes what they worship. He removes it. He created it. He's the Creator. He created it with the breath of His mouth. But uh, He is going to remove it. There are so many organizations today that uh, really fight for planet Earth because it is our only home it's we have to do the best with planet earth because without planet earth we are lost there's no other home 
So uh, Mother Earth, uh, in fact, it, it's our, the only home we have, and we have to honor Mother Earth. In fact, the Earth Care people, they have this friendly reminder constantly, this is the only home we have. Aren't you glad that God has promised us a different home? That Jesus said when he left, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again. That's a promise. And receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. So God has promised us another home. For the Christian, our citizenship is not here, is it? Our citizenship is in heaven. And I'm glad about that. I'm glad about that because I can see it already that this earth is coming to uh, to uh, a point that we're going to be looking at today. So, uh, love your mother. Well, God has something to say about this. This is this was something that was uh, true in Paul's day in Romans chapter one verse twenty five. Uh, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul wrote, "They exchanged the truth about God for a lie." and worshiped and served, uh, and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised, amen. Well, God is gonna change that. In the seventh seal judgment, he changes it with seven trumpet judgments. So let's stand and we're going to read the text together. Uh, we're gonna to read the whole chapter. It's one of the, the shorter chapters in the book of Revelation. It's only 13 verses long. But uh, let's take a look at them, starting in verse 1. Let's read together. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of a half an hour. And I saw seven angels who stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. Verse 4. And the smoke of the incense which came up with the, prayer, with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and cast it upon the earth. And there were voices and thunderclaps and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Verse 7. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood, and they were cast upon the earth. And the third part of the trees was burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. Verse 10. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers, and upon the fountains of the waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters, because they were made bitter. Verse 12. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars so that the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the mist of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your word. You said that heaven and earth would pass away before one little jot or one tittle of your word fails. So Lord, we know that we're reading the future of planet earth because you've already seen exactly how it's going to happen. You are the God who sees the end from the beginning. 
And Lord, uh, we are uh, just uh, humble, Lord, at, at what is going to happen to planet Earth. But Lord, thank you that you've given us salvation through Jesus Christ. Thank you that you've given us citizenship in a whole new place. Uh, thank you, Lord, that you are in control. This is your earth. You are the creator God, maker of heaven and earth. And Lord, uh, now teach us by your Holy Spirit. Be with the preacher. May his words be your words. Lord, may we be built up as a result of looking at this passage, that we would become better ambassadors for you, so that we can share our faith with our friends and family. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Let's go back to verse 1 and 2. And when he had opened the seventh seal, now we know the he here, going back in the text, we know that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that was uh, took the scroll of the seven seals from the one sitting on the throne, from God the Father, and he is opening them one by one. Exactly the space of time between the seals, we do not know what they are. Uh, but when it comes to the seventh seal, it says there was silence in heaven about the space of a half hour. Uh, let's just talk about that first. You remember in the last chapter, in chapter 7, we were in the middle of, of gigantic praise in heaven. We saw a group, uh, a redeemed group from planet Earth that were redeemed out of the Great Tribulation up in heaven, which was beyond number, as we uh, talked about last week in chapter 7. And uh, we, we realized that all the angels were joining in in this praise. And how many angels are there? Innumerable. And uh, we also know that the, the elders uh, representing the church uh, were taking uh, part in this praise. And the four living creatures were taking part in this praise. I mean, the heaven was echoed with praise. And then all of a sudden, the Lord Jesus Christ opens that seventh seal. And when he opens that seventh seal, there is absolute silence in heaven. The seventh seal is broken, and all the rejoicing, all the celebration stops. We got a heater going in the corner. But I guarantee you in heaven it's dead silent. breaking of the seventh seal ends the celebration in heaven just for a moment and causes a period of silence in heaven for about 30 minutes. This is an unusual thing because even the four living creatures, they rest not day or night saying what? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And they rest not day or night saying that over and over and over again that echoes through the throne room of God. But here there is dead silence. They know what's coming. They know in those seven seals that there are, I mean, that seventh seal is made up of seven trumpet judgments. And now they have come to the point of realizing what a shift there is in our Creator God, who pronounced everything about planet Earth as good. This is good. This is very good in the creation story. But now he's going to reverse it. And the way he reverses it creates silence in heaven. So in verse 2, we are told, And I saw seven angels who stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Now, uh, I, I just want to bring this point out because I found it interesting. The word stood, uh, the angels who stood before God, stood there, the verb is in the perfect tense. That is most unusual. It means that they were, they were 
in a prolonged stance. This is the first time we actually see them in the throne room of God. And we, there is no mention of them before, but now they are mentioned. They're standing there. How long they've been standing there? A long time. It's almost as if they knew that the judgment of God was eventually going to come and that was going to be their duty call. And uh, so they're standing there, they're part of the throne room of God, but then they are issued seven trumpets and they stand there ready to, to blow each trumpet. Now the spacing between the trumpets, we don't, we don't know. Scripture doesn't tell us how long of a time there is between the first trumpet and the second and the third and the fourth. We do know that some trumpets are longer than others. Definitely, when we get to the fifth trumpet, we are told the fifth trumpet lasts five months. Five months. Uh, and we'll get to that next week. But uh, the, the timing is wholly up to the God who is opening the scroll and uh, when each trumpet is, is, uh, is announced. Now these are overlapping. Remember, if, if, if we look at the scenario of the sixth seal, it was pretty bleak. And when man is calling to the rocks and the hills to fall on them, you know, it looks pretty bleak. But remember, each judgment uh, is, it goes all the way to the very end. Uh, it, and so there is a crossover here among some of these uh, trumpets as we will look uh, with that sixth seal. We'll see that in just a minute. But let's uh, go now to verse 3, 4, and 5. Another angel came and stood at the altar and having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, which came out was with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God. We've already covered this with the children's message. Just, we, I, I want to restate that our prayers come right up before God, right before God. Don't think that your prayers aren't heard. They are heard, they are stored in golden bowls, and God is now going to answer specific prayers that are related to what's gonna be coming in the judgments ahead. So uh, uh, the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and cast it upon the earth, and there were voices and thunderclaps and lightnings and an earthquake. So uh, prayers have always been known by the saints of old, as well as today, uh, both in the Old and New Testament, we are told that it is symbolic, there is a symbolic way that we can see how our prayers are before God with incense. May my prayer be set before you like incense, the psalmist writes in Psalm 14, I'm sorry, Psalm 141 too. And uh, it, it is uh, uh, a picture for us that God is trying to tell us that your prayers are valuable. You know, the devil wants to tell you that nobody's gonna listen to you anyway. You know, your prayer, don't bother praying. That's a lie from the devil. Every prayer is important. Every prayer. And here God is trying to tell us he's going to answer the people's prayers as brought out in Daniel 9, 1 through 19. Uh, how many times have people prayed the Lord's Prayer? For how many generations? When the disciples asked Jesus, teach us to pray. And when Jesus taught them to pray, part of that prayer was what? Thy kingdom come. How many generations have prayed for that? Over and over. Let your kingdom come, Lord. What's the postponement about? May your kingdom come. Well, it's finally going to come. And then there's prayers for deliverance from the enemies. I mean, that has been every generation. The psalmist writes in 25 2, I trust in you. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. And uh, in Psalm 13, 1 and 2, the how long prayers, people have always prayed this question. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? 
How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart all the day? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? And that was the prayer of, of uh, the tribulational saints too. You know, how long will my enemies be exalted over me? Remember the fifth, the fifth uh, seal judgment and the souls under, uh, under the altar. That was two Sundays ago. If you don't remember that, uh, go to the website, go in the archive section and you can pull up the sermon on that. But uh, these are people that were martyred, uh, beheaded, most of them, uh, and killed and hunted down during the tribulation because of their faith. And they were under this altar of incense uh, and they were praying, the souls were praying. And what were they praying? They cried out with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And we're gonna see, I, we're gonna see how God actually avenges their blood with blood. And that's coming. Revelation 6 verse 10. So these people, they, they get their prayers answered. God says, don't think that I've forgotten. Your prayers have always been an incense. And so we come to uh, verse 5. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and cast it to the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Again, he took uh, the censer and filled it with fire from the altar, speaking of judgment. Here, the prayers were going to receive proper treatment and uh, God was going to act upon it. And the angel starts off by throwing the, this, this, the, the prayers down to earth. Here it is. And God along says, yeah, this is my answer. Here comes my answer. You ready for my answer? You know, God has promised to us after every time we pray for vengeance, God has reminded us that vengeance is mine, says the Lord. You know, do not revenge uh, yourselves, beloved, but give place to God's wrath, for it is written, vengeance belongs to me, I will repay, says the Lord. And that is what he's doing now. Uh, he's going to answer. And the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. And they sound one at a time. <coughs> and here comes the first one. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood. And they were cast upon the earth. And the third part of the trees was burnt up. And all the green grass. Here is something that God is doing. It is, it is a miracle judgment because he's taking two extreme opposites. He's taking fire and he's taking ice. He's combining them and he's bringing it down with blood. And uh, it's coming down and showering down on planet Earth. It says that uh, we know this is a supernatural judgment because it's, it's fire and ice. This is no normal hailstone storm. This is a supernatural hailstorm. And it's coming down with, with fire and brimstone, along with blood. We know in California how serious uh, some of our forest fires can be. But this isn't just going to be a local little fire. This is going to take out one third, one third of every green tree on planet Earth. And it's going to take out all of the green grass. And so uh, the first trumpet, again, God doesn't take all the green away. He takes just enough green away so that those ecologists are going berserk at this point. What is going on here in our world? But God is removing what he created. The beautiful color of green won't be seen too much. Uh, during this time and I believe God is doing it a third at a time and we'll see how he does it in stages later on in the book of Revelation but he does it to get people's he's trying to get people's attention you see creation is important to God and it should be important to us I'm not saying that we shouldn't love our earth we should be good stewards of what God has given us 
But do we reach a point of worshiping Mother Earth? No. But to God, something is very special here. You are more important than the trees. Man is made in the image of God, and God will do anything he can, even if it means removing what the people might be worshiping so that they would might look up and say, this is supernatural that is happening. So that they might be part of that group that we saw in chapter seven that came out of the great tribulation praising God. God will do anything to save us all. Uh, he is uh, uh, the great savior, savior of us all. And so uh, we have in the first trumpet uh, one third of the trees was burnt up and all the green grass all the green grass is burnt up so green is being taken away on planet earth and uh, it, when you remove that much timber from the earth uh, it's, it's going to create quite a calamity there's already uh, uh, just a, a, a perplexed people on planet Earth and uh, and they are deeply concerned and, and this has not uh, reduced that concern at all. By removing one third of the trees, a loss of wood for construction is removed. A uh, loss of watershed for protection is removed. Massive death of animals is going to happen. Crops will be devastated, leaving even less food to eat. Remember that there, we're going through a famine time. Uh, the fifth, the entire globe is scorched. Uh, the green beauty for the eye is removed. Uh, those who worship Mother Nature as God, watch their false God removed by the one and only true God. The true God will get involved in global warming. If you're concerned about global warming, watch what God does with it. Watch what God does with it. God will turn up the heat. And uh, he's going to change the atmosphere radically. These are just some local points that suffered a major uh, forest fire. But we're talking about a fire caused by fire and brimstone with blood being cast to the earth. Uh, and uh, it's going to be quite devastating to one third of the earth. Then the second angel sounded, second trumpet. And as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea and the third part of the sea became blood remember back in uh, chapter 7 that the angels that hold the four corners of the earth the wind you know they are able to stop it and so the ocean is probably perfectly flat perfectly flat at this time and you can imagine if this is uh, if this burning mountain. I mean, this is the way John, the Apostle John, describes it as a, as a large burning mountain. If that burning mountain was, let's say, the size of Mount McKinley or even Mount Everest, and it's coming down and it hits in the middle of the ocean, it creates quite a tsunami, a tidal wave, and that's what destroys one third of the ships. One third of all the ships on the sea are destroyed as a result of that. So uh, this hits the ocean and this mountain burning was cast in the sea. And the third part of the sea, one third of the sea becomes blood. Remember I told you a, a couple months ago that you might as well throw science out the door. Scientists are gonna try, how do we explain this? God doesn't need any science to make this happen. God just speaks and it happens. If he wants the water to turn to blood, he can do it. We saw that in, in the ten, 10 plagues against Egypt in the Old Testament. He turned all the fresh water into blood. You didn't need any science for that. You just needed the word of, of God to do it. And this is what he does. One third of all the sea turns to blood. And uh, uh, as a result of that, the third part of the creatures which were in the sea that had life died. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. The 
food supplies or even less than that. God is removing his creation. Don't think God doesn't care about the creatures in the ocean. He does, but he cares much more for man. Man who is made in his image. He's trying to get man to look away from that created creation and look up and see him in heaven. That's his desire. So he's using everything possible uh, to get man's attention. And so, uh, again, the third part of the ships are destroyed. So travel on among uh, the sea is, uh, is not going to happen. A tremendous tsunami is going to take place when that mountain hits the sea and it's going to take out one third of the ships. So one third of uh, transport among the, those that uh, do their transportation on the sea, it's not going to happen. It's not going to be there. So the second trumpet, something like a great mountain burning with fire, was thrown into the sea and uh, one third of the sea turns to blood. A third of the sea creatures die, and the mega tsunami destroys one third of the ships. You can imagine how the ecologists are going absolutely berserk. Those that were sold out to worshiping Mother Earth. They're seeing it all removed in front of their eyes. Save the earth is, is, uh, is something that man has always promoted up until this point. The unification of the world, after all. See, you have to understand, this is their religion. It's all they have. Planet Earth is it. And if you remove our earth, you're removing our only hope, our only home. It's the only thing they believe in. The now, the here, the this, this is it, the here and now, that's all there is. And if you take that away, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. And uh, so, uh, to this very day, there's a great effort to preserve Mother Earth. And God's going to have an impact on that. You know, uh, Mother Earth, when it sees those uh, those first few trumpets, it's going to change. Mother Earth, everything that, uh, at least one third of the green will be removed in the trees. All the green grass. Uh, it's, it's a time where the focus won't be on Mother Earth anymore. God wants this to be the focus. In the beginning, what? God created the heavens and the earth. You know, we need to see who the creator is, and it's not Mother Earth. Going to the next trumpet judgment, verse 10. And the third angel sounded, and there fell, fell a great star from heaven, burning as though it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers, and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters, because they were made bitter. So here we have the star coming down and hitting uh, the, uh, the ozone layer. And as it hits the ozone layer, this comet uh, probably maybe breaks apart. Uh, but this wormwood comes down and lands on one third of the fresh water supply on planet Earth to make it undrinkable. To make it undrinkable. You know, uh, just being here in California, let's just look at, at our water situation in California. I live half my life in Southern California. And uh, I'll tell you that se Southern California is semi-arid desert. 80% of the water that they get is all important. It's all important. If it wasn't important, you couldn't live you would not be able to live in Southern California. But we get our water from the California Aqueduct, 
okay? That's, uh, that's actually coming from, from our streams and our mountains in central California and uh, coming down the California aqueduct. Uh, they also get water from the eastern Sierras uh, in Mono Lake. If you've ever gone up to Mammoth, you realize that there's an aqueduct coming down that Los Angeles built to bring water down to them from the, from the uh, east side of the Sierras. And then the third major source is the Colorado River Aqueduct, and that's where all the water comes from. What's going to happen to the millions and millions of people if one third of the water supply is hit here? the only solution. It really is. <laughs> you know, if you've gone over the Tehachapi, you've seen man's attempts to build uh, ways to pump water over the Tehachapi to bring that Central Valley aqueduct uh, down to Southern California. Uh, there's a great deal of effort, but there won't be time or energy at that time. It's going to be a time of moving, a time of moving. You know, if there's no water, there's no life. Water is the basic element for life. And the God who created planet Earth and gave us beautiful water to enjoy and drink is now removing not all of it, one third, one third. So it comes to the point where a drop of water is worth more than a sack of gold to a thirsty man. But what that's going to do, it's going to, it's going to cause quite, quite a lot of devastation on planet Earth. You know, we don't, we aren't told what one third of the Earth will be affected. But I can tell you, landmass-wise just so you'll know how large a third of the land mass really is. If you were to take North America, Central America, and South America, you basically have one third of the earth. One third of the earth will be without fresh water. So if you take that group out, where are those people gonna go? The answer is given by Jane here, they're moving. You're gonna have to. But it's not going to be an easy time because what happened to one third of the ships? Yeah. This is going to be a horrific time on planet Earth. Hopefully some people will think about the word of God and Jesus. What he had to say to the woman at the well. You know, if you ask of me, I will give you living water. You know, if anyone thirsts, let them come to me and drink. You know, maybe, just maybe, if it's only one that will turn their heart to the Lord, it's all worthwhile to God. That's how important one soul is to God. See, God has used everything. God has used his day of grace, and men still mock him. But now he's using his day of judgment. So that on judgment day, when they appear before him on the great white throne judgment, they will be completely without excuse. They will say, well, God, if you did it this way, if, if you would have sent an angel and preached the gospel, well, God is going to send an angel and he's going to be flying through the sky preaching the everlasting gospel. That's still ahead in the book of Revelation. So that's still coming. And that God uses everything, every means. Uh, and now he's using the removal of creation, not all at once, but in stages to try and get man to repent and turn to him. So here's the fourth trumpet and the fourth angel sounded and the third part of the sun was smitten. Interesting word and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars, so that the third part of them was darkened, 
And the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. So we're going to lose, supernaturally, one third of the sun. We're going to lose, obviously, because of that, one third of the moon and one third of the stars. Well, you go, Dr. Mittman, didn't we cover in the sixth seal that the stars are falling like untimely figs? Yes, they are. When the sixth seal is broken, those figs are dropping. But remember, it has seven years to drop. And they're dropping. And they're dropping. Boom, boom, boom. They're dropping. They're dropping. But when it reaches the eighth, when it reaches chapter eight here, and the fourth trumpet, one third of them will just be smashed out of existence. One third of them just blank out and so um, there's harmony to uh, these these judgments and uh, it's going to be a dark time on planet earth the third part of it of each of these so uh, the word here eplege in the greek it it means to uh to smash it, it, it means to pound it, it means to almost like a taking your fist it's like god takes his, uh, pounds the sun. Uh, he, he puts a big black spot in the sun. One third of it uh, is, uh, is uh, and the word means again, to pound, to inflict with calamity. So that is, a, again, a supernatural thing. And how many sun god worshipers are there on planet Earth? They're going to see their god being pounded away and uh, one third of it that's what happens uh, so if you take one third of the sun uh, and it darkens a third of the moon and a third of the stars is you're going to get one third less light uh, natural light on planet earth so days uh, so any type of daylight is going to be much shorter much shorter on planet earth so we see the creator god and what is he doing overall? He's taking one third of creation away. He's saying, it's time to look to me, the creator. It's time to look to me. Unfortunately, what we're going to see is something quite unbelievable. Instead of men falling on their knees and saying, God, forgive me. We're going to see in the coming chapters, man taking his fist, shaking it at God realizing and acknowledge that there is a God, but so hateful that they shout blasphemies to God and shake their fist at God. Uh, it's, it's a sad scenario, but you know what that tells me? <laughs> People are saying God isn't doing any miracles anymore. Oh, yes, he is. You know what the greatest miracle is? It's the salvation of the soul. One person. One person who comes to Christ. When we know that the corruption that sin has done to our hearts uh, and the fallen nature of man, that uh, every time someone gives their heart to the Lord, uh, it's a great, great miracle. It really is. We come to our last verse, verse 13. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. You know, this is, uh, it's called the, the three woe judgments. Those last three trumpets are known as the three woe judgments. They are so severe. And we'll start looking at one of them next week. But we just covered four trumpets this morning in seven verses. The other three trumpets will take 50 verses. You haven't seen anything yet. God is not done. God is not done. 
And uh, so the angel is flying and saying, whoa, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth. Today, um, we're going to celebrate much more devastating woe than any of these trumpet judgments could ever produce. Today we're going to be coming to the Lord's table. And at that table, Jesus asks us to do this. First of all, be motivated by his word. Know what's coming. And know that there is a solution that people need to know about. People need to know that there is a Savior. They don't need to worry about this. And I'm thankful that I don't need to worry about this. Because I won't be here. And anyone who is in Christ Jesus won't be here. We will be raptured and taken out. We will be rescued from this earth. But when we come to the Lord's table, he tells us each time to do this in remembrance of me. The worst wrath of all. We're looking at God's wrath, the day of his wrath. We're looking at it. But the worst wrath of all was poured upon Jesus on the cross. That's something that we can't see. We can visualize the crown of thorns. We can visualize the beatings that he got from the Roman soldiers. We can visualize the large spikes that went into the hands of our Savior. We can visualize the, the, the spear coming into his side and, and him bleeding. We can visualize what it meant to our Lord when he said, I thirst, and they give him vinegar. We can visualize the crucifixion physically. But the worst part is when in Isaiah 53, when it says, God laid on him the iniquity of us all. You would not want to see Dr. Mittman's iniquity. My wife sees enough of it. And I don't want to see hers. Those two alone are enough to gross us out and to turn away. But it says, the Bible says that he took the iniquity of us all of all mankind, of all generations, everyone seated here this morning, he took your sin and laid it upon him. We can't visualize that. But he paid the price. He did it because of his great love. To help us remember this morning, uh, there's a, a hymn. Um, and this hymn I, I picked out because it brings out the point of Christ became sin for us. I want us to focus in on that, on the words of this hymn as we sing it. So I'm gonna ask you, uh, as you come up to take uh, the, uh, the bread and, and uh, uh, the cup uh, when you come up for that as I want you to sing the words of the song and do the singing in remembrance of him let the words of the song enrich your memory of how uh, to approach our Lord's table you know our Lord wants us to do it in remembrance of him so I'm going to ask you uh, to come forward as we sing this song. And when we're finished the singing, um, we will then uh, partake together. This is open communion.
you do not need to be a member of Copper Canyon Baptist Church, but you do need to be a member of Christ's Church, the Universal. You need to know him as Lord and Savior. Do not partake of this table without knowing Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. You do it to your own harm uh, if, you, if you take it uh, unworthily. And so take it knowing Jesus. If you have prayed to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then you are right to come to this table. And uh, we want to invite you all. So we'll sing this hymn together. And after singing that, uh, we'll partake of the elements uh, uh, together. Oh, uh -huh. 
night in which our Lord was betrayed, 